A special look at the continuing fallout from Hamas's October attack in Israel and the ongoing war that's followed. Good evening and welcome to Faith Nation from the CBN headquarters in Virginia Beach. I'm Brody Carter. Closing in on a year after the Hamas attack of October 7th, Israel's sons, daughters and fathers continue shipping off to war, while others are still being held hostage in Gaza. As national security correspondent Caitlin Burke reports, the ongoing conflict and potential of war in the north is testing the resilience of a people all too familiar with hardship. Frozen in time, that's the feeling for many within the Jewish community ever since Hamas attacked Israel. Come. The morning of the 7th, everybody remembers like where they were at that moment. Active duty and reserve soldiers alike immediately packing their bags and responding to a call that had not yet come. He just picked up his, you know, his gear, got all his things for reserve duty. His friend from his crew picked him up and he drove straight to the base. And he got ready in like five minutes and he gave me a hug and uh, he said, I'll take your car and, uh, and I'll bring it back. Next time I saw my car, it was three and a half months later. Family members left behind to wonder, worry, and hold down the home front, then and now. I guess I can say it's been a really rough time, a really restless time, a very insecure time, a time where dad most of the time is not at home. And also when he is at home, we are not sure when they will call him um, to go back to the reserve. When her husband deployed, Yael, also a reservist, felt most useful at the military base. A dentist by trade, she put her skills to work, despite being pregnant with her first child. Like we're all, let's say, dentists, teachers, I don't know, lawyers, but then we have like this separate parallel person where we're in the army and this is our job in the army when we're medics and we're officers and like a whole different person and you know how to be this person and this person and you can switch like and in you know between these two different people amira used art as an outlet for her fear and anxiety after her son deployed and i started uh, just uh, dotting leaves and and i saw that i was dotting away and suddenly four hours passed and i hadn't thought of anything so honestly, all I did for the first month is dot leaves. For about 12 hours a day, I have thousands of beautiful leaves dotted. And, um, and that was my therapy. What started as a distraction for her mind became an inspiration for others overcome by war when it was featured in a Knesset exhibit on the resilience of soldiers and families. And I see from my friends, we all go through the anxiety, sleepless nights, you know, taking it medication, having panic attacks, uh, uh, trying to be strong when the boys come back from the army and, you know, holding ourselves. And as soon as they leave, you know, we fall apart again. With her husband still cycling through deployments, Crystal knows that feeling all too well. Still, each day she puts on a brave face for her four children. At one side, life just keeps on going. You know, the children were in school, now they have vacation, they have like a, a program that they, they do uh, things in the vacation. And then, then suddenly there will be rockets fired and you're saying, hey kids, we're okay, everything is fine. And you know, you know it's not okay, and you know it's not fine. And you're all the time acting. The nation, surrounded by enemies, is familiar with living under constant threat. Although this fight is putting the resilience of the Israeli people to the test, making it necessary for outside organizations to step in and provide critical support. Throughout the war, the Atalef Foundation has worked to meet the needs of Israel's most elite special forces unit and also their families. Crystal, Amira and Yael are all part of this community. So I know the Atalef Foundation very, very well throughout the years. and. Constantly, they were reaching out, trying to do like, you know, different uh, projects and support groups. And there was like a phone call that you could always call uh, also for, you know, if you want to ask questions, if you want to know what's going on. Psychological sessions for the woman that organizes night, nights out. I was in night out, I think in March, they took us to some kind of stand up nice performance. It was really nice. And I met the other woman over there. And I, I guess it was the first time that actually went out since uh, since the 7th of October. The foundation's sister organization, American Friends of Israeli Navy SEALs, has raised millions for soldiers and their families since this current war began. 
including support for 500 spouses who are managing their homes, families, and careers alone, and a reintegration program for when their loved ones finally return. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. Two war-weary countries healing from their scars together. Details on a new partnership helping those traumatized by war up next. Welcome back. CBN Israel and Regent University are helping Israelis traumatized by October 7th and the ongoing war. One key is using therapy techniques learned by counselors during the Ukraine war with Russia. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has more on this collaboration. After the October 7th massacre and ensuing war, Regent University involved its International Institute of Postgraduate Education in Ukraine to train Russian-speaking counselors in Israel. Together with CBN Israel and the Israel Trauma Coalition, they came up with a plan. We've been feeling so connected to Israeli people in our suffering and your suffering because it's very similar to what we experienced as a nation when we experienced barbarian attack on our democracy, on our freedom in the middle of the 21st century. Here at the Maccabea village, Jewish athletes from around the world come to train and compete in the Jewish Olympics. This week, dozens of Russian-speaking therapists have come for a different kind of training. I'm faculty at Regent University and uh, brought two colleagues with me from Ukraine who are uh, trained to um, educate psychologists in immediate stabilization procedure, compassion fatigue, stress management. Dr. Olya Zaporozhets says trauma from war is ongoing and the Ukrainian professionals have current experience that's valuable in the Israeli situation. We came to talk about how to help people going through stressful events, whether that's bombings or soldiers in a trench. That is both civilian and military. Psychologist Katarina Krilova says Israelis were eager to learn. They've been gracious to us and we appreciate it. Also, Regent University made this happen. Because of the war in Ukraine, they first came to teach us, and now we are able to come to Israel and share here. Psychologist Ludmila Horodianko, who works with both Ukrainian children and adults, shared skills intended to quickly calm trauma victims. And by using these techniques, a victim can be stabilized in just 20 minutes. They also covered compassion fatigue, burnout from listening to the psychological trauma of others. Max Goldenberg heads the Israel Trauma Coalition, a leading agency addressing trauma among Israelis in both the southern and northern parts of the country. Goldenberg says one and a half million people here feel the impact of the Iron Swords War, either because they lost family members or share connections with the hostages. What we need right now is practical tools that can be implemented immediately tomorrow while, uh, during their work with their patients, with the families and individuals that they, that they support. The Russian-speaking counselors immigrated to Israel decades ago. Some are helping those who fled the war in Ukraine, as well as Holocaust survivors, soldiers and others. They credit the immediate stabilization procedure developed in Israel by psychiatrist Gary Quinn as their most valuable tool. It involves tapping one's own arms or shoulders or the table while focusing on the fact that they are safe now and not still in the traumatic situation. At the beginning of the Ukraine war, Quinn volunteered to first help therapists there, then train them to use the procedure. All of the therapists themselves were at a very high level of stress because of the war and had to do the uh, ISP first to calm them down. During that time, he cites an incredible collaboration with Zaporozhets, Regent University, and CBN to modify and adjust the method. The product coming came back in a better condition, much more streamlined and much more effective and efficient in helping people. The Israeli counselors felt enriched by what they learned. It's really an excellent tool and I'll use it a lot. It's not a treatment. It brings a person back to the place where he can function. Zaporozhets says she's taking Israeli resilience back to Ukraine, as illustrated by the humorous saying Jewish people have about their celebrations and feast days. Yeah, they were trying to kill us. We survived. Let's eat. It's great. I'm taking it home. 
She believes the key is a love for country and fighting for the future to leave a better legacy for your children. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Kfar Maccabia, Israel. A Christian community in the north prepares for potential battle with Hezbollah. How they're staying strong when Faith Nation returns. As the fight against Hamas continues, the IDF is also at odds with Hezbollah. Those living in northern Israel could soon be on the front lines. Chuck Holton brings us the story of a Christian village under threat near the Lebanese border. In this small village located in the hills of northern Israel, daily life continues despite the threat of war. Daily rocket attacks by Hezbollah keep the region in a state of heightened alert with fear of an imminent escalation. In response, Israel is launching strikes deep into Lebanon, targeting firing positions, ammunition depots, and key operatives. The Hezbollah have today also drones. They have precision-guided missiles. They have 80,000 fighters with elite unit well-trained in Syria, civil war, 10 years with Wagner force, with Syria, with Iranian forces. So we know that they are very dangerous because they have a very radical Islamic Shia ideology. Maronite Christians here have a long history of persevering through adversity. As they face the prospect of another war, they draw upon their rich heritage and the support of their tight-knit community. Well, we're still gathering in our church as usual, uh, albeit with uh, maybe a bit of a larger number. We are peaceful people. We pray for peace, we want peace, we want the war to come to an end, and we pray for that uh, purpose. The Israeli Defense Forces have evacuated everybody who lives between where I'm standing and the Lebanese border, which is that hillside right back behind me. It's only about 4.6 kilometers from here, and I'm standing right on the edges of a Maronite Christian community called Jish. The people who live here have not been evacuated, and if they want to leave, they can leave on their own, but they won't get help from the government to do so. And that means that the people who have decided to stay are trusting in the IDF and in God to keep them safe. This is not existential threat only for Israel. Hezbollah terrorists are existential threat to the Maronites here in Israel and to any other population in Israel as Israelis and to the Maronites on Lebanon too, because they want to turn Lebanon to Islamic state. The IDF is preparing to protect people here if all-out conflict breaks out. With emergency shelters and essential supplies, Home Front Command is working to ensure the safety of civilians, bringing in bomb shelters, and providing refuge for those in need. We face so many persecution and oppression and genocide during uh, centuries in this land. And our faith is the only one who kept us standing in this land in our forefathers' land, not giving up for any other foreign forces who are trying to submit us under Islamic rules. And that's because we believe in Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior, that told us, never fear, because I am with you. As rockets continue to fall and counterattacks persist, people here remain caught in the middle. For the evacuated, returning home is a dream that won't be realized until a lasting resolution can be found. Despite those challenges, the resilience and faith of these communities remain unshakable. From northern Israel, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Educating Americans about the roots of anti-Semitism, the mission behind a Hot Topic book, up next. Telling authors Noah Tishby and Emmanuel Acho. They say they wrote it to connect the dots between Jewish hatred and stereotypes, to show how they're fueling anti Semitism today. Wendy Griffith has more. The Jewish race, is that a thing? Are Jewish people white? But Jewish people control Hollywood, right? Am I even allowed to say Jew? Hi, everyone. I'm Noah Tishby, and I am a Jew. 
And I'm Emmanuel Acho, and I have Uncomfortable Conversations. Mm -hmm. In their new book, the co-authors of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Jew talk about seeing a problem and taking steps to address it. Emmanuel noticed over a year before October 7th the rise of anti-Semitism, and it was very interesting to me that somebody from outside of the Jewish community was able to detect that something is brewing. So he called he called me and he asked me if I would like to write this book, and I, I literally couldn't have said yes faster. We're called to love people, but how can you love what you don't know? I finally got to learn about my present-day Jewish brothers and sisters, what breaks their heart, what makes them smile, what makes them cry, and so I can try mm. to be a, a genuine ally to those that are hurting. Noah, you are Jewish. What are some of those stereotypes that are painful, that are heartbreaking, that uh, you wish weren't there? And how mm. do we address them? Well, beautiful question. So first of all, the thing to understand is that anti-Semitism, which is anti-Jewish hate, is the oldest form of hate and discrimination that is still being practiced today. We see first uh, accounts of anti-Semitism in 300 BC in Alexandria and Egypt. So the Jews have always been the brunt of kind of like a Bear, bore the brunt of, of hate around the world. Anti-Semitism can look something like the Jews are the vermin of the earth and they're disgusting like the Nazis used to say, but they also sound like, well, the Jews control the media and the Jews control the banks, which is also an anti-Semitic trope that people don't understand. Tish Bianacho's book hits shelves just as pro-Palestinian protests spread across America's college campuses bringing with them unprecedented levels of anti-Semitic statements and acts of violence. And the thing to understand is this, they have been led to believe and been brainwashed to believe mm -hmm. that Israel is actually causing a genocide on the Palestinian people, that Israel is a white colonialist state that shouldn't exist. And this has been going on for decades, so much so that now they think that anything that Israel does, and by extension, anything the Jews do, is wrong and needs to be dismantled. I am not discrediting Palestinian pain in any way, shape, or form. And being critical of Israeli government's policies is completely legitimate. This is not what we're seeing on campuses today. We're seeing gas the Jews. We're seeing such hate that is the result of decades of intentional poisoning. And we need to be very careful where this can lead. Tishbi, an Israeli activist and actress, recently tried to reason with anti-Israel protesters at the Sundance Film Festival, finding that most did not have their facts straight. From the river to the sea, Palestine needs to be free from the occupation, that, which is, is illegal. What's the river? Um, uh, <laughs> I forgot the river's the name, sea? but the sea is the Red Sea. The Palestinian genocide, it's just awful. What about the hostages? Do you know about the hostages? Unfortunately, I'm not that educated about that part. She fears what we've seen on college campuses comes dangerously close to jihadism. So if you support jihadism, if you support that political arm uh, of Islam as it manifests in Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas and ISIS and all the rest, then you, you, you're you not on the side of history that supports democracy and liberties and everything we hold dear. Acho, a former NFL linebacker and Fox Sports analyst, hopes their book will be an antidote that can possibly turn hatred to hope and even love. First and foremost, I would hope for knowledge. I, I, love, I loved pursuing this book as a Christian man and the son of a pastor because of my affinity and intrigue by and for the Jewish community, right? When you read the Bible, you read about the Jews, you read about Jesus uh, born in a manger, you read about Nazareth, you read about Bethlehem, but you kind of leave it in the Bible and mm. you don't remember that modern day there are Jews walking amongst you that are suffering. And Noah, again, the stereotypes, what what bugs you? What what stereotype do you just act thinks is ridiculous or what stereotype is true? <laughs> I think the Jewish mama might be a real one because I am one. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and all the all the cliches, I'm like, yeah, I'm very much like that. I really think my son can do no wrong. Uh, that's not true. He definitely can. So that you know, that one might might be a, might be a bit uh, a bit real. But I loved the chapter about the Jewish stereotypes. We just let it all out, asking everything about money, about power, about being cheap, about all these things that to me are extraordinary again because when you come from a place of love and authenticity and faith and and connectivity you can't 
you, there's no, nobody gets triggered, nobody gets upset, nobody gets hurt. You listen and you exchange ideas, and it was just a beautiful thing. Despite the growing anti Semitism, Tishby says she chooses to live wisely and not fearfully, adding that being Jewish is more than her faith. It's a very special way of life. Even the basic thing of a Shabbat dinner, right? Every Friday night, whether you're secular or religious or traditional, whatever, most Jews will have will mark the night. Mm -hmm. So you sit around with your family and you have you don't have mundane conversations and you do kind of this ritual that you've done for thousands of years and it gives an anchor to the family that is pretty positive. Yeah. So there, there's some things about the Jewish way of life. This an obsession with education is something that worked out throughout the years, right? <laughs> so everything that we do is all out there. It's there's nothing secretive about being Jewish. Wendy Griffith, CBN News. Well, that's going to do it for us here at Faith Nation. Have a great night.